Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Open your heart and mind as God's word comes to you. Introducing Pastor David Fadi. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings. The first thing the Word of God shows us is who we are. Then it shows us who we are meant to be. Now the Word. With one another and with you, Thank him for your awesome presence that is in our midst tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit, the author and the spirit of the word. Tonight, as we study the word of God, we ask that the Holy Spirit will open our eyes of understanding. Let our understanding be fruitful tonight. Speak to us directly. Reach out to us through your word. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Put us hands together for Jesus. You're welcome this evening. Uh, We're glad to have you join us for midweek service. Um, For a couple of weeks, we've been discussing on the subject. Uh, of David um, our first Bible character study here at the main campus church I will be studying David most importantly about him is that the Bible calls him a man after God's heart Acts chapter 13 and verse 22 and when he had removed him talking about Saul he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So the major reason why we are studying David was because of that qualification. And the Bible calls him a man after God's heart. And that is crucial. Because the Bible makes makes it clear in 2 Chronicles 16, 9. 2 Chronicles 16. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord is running to and fro. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth. To show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. So God is looking for those people whose heart is perfect towards him. So if we were given an example in David, that David is a man after God's heart, then I feel it's going to be, uh, it, it really be a tremendous blessing to us to study his life and highlight one or two things there that made him a man after God's heart. So we've been studying for the past few weeks. I would like to ask us, so in some of the things we have um, highlighted in the life of David, who can tell me one or two striking things about David's heart that you have picked and that you're already working on in your own life? So I don't want to do a recap first. I'd like you to just give it back to me. Some of the things we have highlighted, those who have been attending for the past almost, all right, yes, almost four weeks now, if not more. All right, so that is highlighting one of the things we considered, which is David's absolute trust in God. David's heart absolutely trusts in God. Who can tell me in the other ways we saw David's trust in God? Some of the things that David does that make us know that David absolutely trusts in God. Anybody? Yes. You said what? When he fought against Goliath, uh, tell me more. What happened there? How do we know that he absolutely trusted in God? 
when he fought against Goliath. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, so um, Dr. Ben spoke elaborately on this last week when he said that on every, in every situation, David always knows that God is aware. So when he went to Goliath, he was like, I come to you in the name of God because you have defied the armies of the living God. So he knew that he was not the one actually going to fight Goliath because Goliath had defied the armies of God. So if he's going to fight this battle, God is behind him. And God would want to win the victory to his name because Goliath had defied his name. And then God must take the glory. So he actually trusted in God wholeheartedly that this battle was going to be won. Praise the Lord. All right. Thank you so much. That's a good one. Any other person? Uh, let me just add to that. One of the things we see in the life of David is that before David embarks on anything, he always inquires of God. Even, even, if, even though he has the strength, the capacity, the technical know-how, the military ability, before he steps out on, to do anything, he always seeks the face of God, which is to show us how much he has committed his heart to God, how much he trusts God, how much he relies on God. And we saw a few occasions that he did those things without considering God. And we saw the outcome. When he numbered the people, what happened? Because God, he didn't inquire of God before he numbered them. And people were dying in their numbers. So that is one thing we saw about David's heart. His absolute trust in God. Who else can tell me something else about David's heart that we have talked about? Which is supposed to be changing the way we think. Yes, my friend. Just tell me your name. Okay, I'm going to end God's view. I believe from what you've taught us that um, hey, uh, David always go back to God with a broken heart. Beautiful. So we saw that David has a repentant and broken heart. It is not that David is perfect in all his ways. But for every time David is confronted with something that he did wrong, he never proved himself right. He never tried to gloss over them. He will break down. In fact, there are certain times, for instance, when he cut the part of um, Saul's dress, when he cut the, the, the part of the, the, the man's dress, and he didn't kill the man. He just cut, and the Bible says, his heart was troubled within him. That is how broken David's heart was. David cannot, we didn't see David commit the same iniquity twice. Because for every sin that he mistakenly find himself, he will be so broken, he will be so broken and repentant, he will be so sorry, and that godly sorrow will cause repentance for him. Yes, Eddie. Yeah, I think something very interesting in David's um, life that I pick from is that he values the presence of God. So at any point in time, you find David singing, you find him just um, being in that place. He always wants to be where the presence of God is. Thank you. So David is a man that is fully devoted to God. His, his heart is devoted to God. He, we saw it when he became, when the time he became the king of Israel, the ark had already been captured. The first thing he did was to bring back the ark. While they were bringing it, somebody died. They went back again. They still had to bring it again. That was not enough. He said, let us look for a place for God. That I cannot be living inside a good house and God is living inside. His heart is just devoted to God. He would always want to be, in, even when they gave him four different kind of judgments. Which judgment did he pick? He said, let me fall into the hands of God. You will see David always, always cherish the presence of God. He would even say things like, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 91, he that dwell in the secret place of the most high and shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You will see, and that, I think that's one of the reasons why David is the one that wrote most of the songs in the Bible. Because Psalms are actually songs. And those songs were born out of a man who abides in the presence of God. Somebody who dwells, who cherish the presence of God. That is how devoted David was in his heart to God. Another person, something you have picked from the lesson so far. 
and it has really stayed with you. Yes. Okay, you have spoken. Somebody, people raise their hand. Yes. Gaba. Hallelujah. I learned that um, from Papa Ben's teaching, David trusted in God's unfailing love and faithfulness, even in the face of danger. So it actually applied to my life in the time I was in the face of danger. And I knew that there's no way that God would not rescue me from this situation. Great. So we saw David's absolute trust in God. He trusted in God's unfailing love. And that helped him. We would say things like, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for the Lord is what? Is with me. Only somebody who trusts in God can say that. Any other thing that we learned? All right. He never forgets the miracle of God. In fact, I think it is Psalm 136 or 137. He, he, he recounted the miracles of of leaving Egypt through the wilderness, miracle that he did not, he was not there. He was not there. They just told him, but he felt like talking about it again. He never forgets the goodness of God. He never forgets. Just like the, uh, Mary, the Bible said the angels of the Lord came and told her this, this, and the Bible will tell us that, and Mary kept it in, his, in her heart. So David always Keep the goodness of God in his heart that he will never forget. Yes? Who else? All right. Far back. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We see that David never wanted to yield to the enemy. Even when God gave him four judgments, he said that he prefers to fall into the hands of God. So if you look at David's life all through his battles, you see that God gave him victory and he always trusts Lord for victory over his battles. Yeah. Great. Who else? Okay. Okay, you are raising your hand. Are you raising your hand? Okay. Yes. Even when David was, even when David was um, not qualified to build the, the, the temple, he, also, he, he prepared the materials. He was able, like he was ready to go extra miles for God. That's what I, I learned from Yeah, and that talks again of David's devotion to God because for somebody like me, maybe I would have been offended. I want to build God a house and God says you, are, you will not build it. Your hand is stained with so much blood. I should have been offended. But instead of David being offended, what did they, imagine that you brought an offering to church now and uh, you say, oh, pastor, pastor, I want to buy church speaker and all those things. And you said, no, you are not going to buy church a speaker because uh, in your year one, you did something. And you will not buy church speaker. And somebody will have just left church. And say, imagine, that church will have been offended. But instead of being offended, David gathered the money and gave to somebody to buy it in the person's name. That's exactly what he did. He made the provision available for his son to now build the temple. He didn't just make provision available. He documented it. He wrote it so that nobody forgets. That this temple must be built. Great. Another thing. Yes. I like to know that we have been learning, and not just what we learned, how we are using those lessons to reshape our own life, how these lessons are changing us. That's what is important. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In the life of David, I noticed that David really, really trusted God. As in, if we as humans, sometimes we try to put God as a plan B. Like, in case God does not work. fulfill, they will start preparing a solution. But in David's life, God was always plan A. It was either God or nothing. So he never tried to do anything in his own strength or power. He always left everything for God. So I, let me ask your neighbor, is God your plan A or your plan B? Or your only plan? Because in case God does not pay your school fees, you get the, you get the gist. In case God does not supply. So is, let me ask you neighbor again. Is God your plan A, your plan B, or your only plan? <laughs> Another person? No, you have spoken. I don't want somebody that has spoken before. Okay, yes. Be loud. He lived a life of thanksgiving, Yes.
So David is a definition of in everything, give thanks. And I like us to tie it to a cogent point. The only reason why David can give thanks in every situation is because of what? He's trusting God. He just knows that God is good. So even what I'm, if what I'm seeing now does not really look good. It does not change the fact that what? God is good. So nothing would hold back my gratitude to God. Okay. I'll take you as the last. Hallelujah. You have preached today's message. That's, we have not reached that side. You have now preached my message today. You are welcome. <laughs> because all the while we have been looking at David's heart towards God. We have not considered David's heart towards people. So it's just David's and that's where I'm going today. It's David's heart towards people. But there is one thing we have not said in David's heart towards God. Yes, my friend. Great, we already said that, and that, that's a good way to also emphasize that. But I think next week I'm going to be asking that question in a different way. When you have said that, I will now ask you, how is that now applying to you? Because the essence of this teaching is that it could be applied to our life. So now, am I that repentant now? If, I miss, if I'm in a bus and I tell somebody, you are crazy, you are stupid, and immediately my heart tells me you shouldn't say that. Do I feel broken immediately? Do I feel sorry? Or do I just feel, well, is it not only stupid that I said? Is it not somebody that I said somebody is a fool? Me, I just said only stupid. What's there? Is it not only one cigarette that me, I'm smoking? Somebody is taking one packet. Just me, once, one stick, one stick. So when you, to God, lights up something in your heart, do you repent immediately? One other thing we have not talked about is David unreserved reference to God and what belongs to God. Reference and honor for God and what belongs to God. Who can tell me why didn't David kill Saul when he had the opportunity to kill Saul? What's the reason? Because Saul was God's anointed. Nothing more, nothing else. Saul was God's anointed. Because the anointing of God was upon him, he put that honor on him. He put that reference on him. Therefore, the lesson we should learn is that everything that bears the name of God, everything that pertains and belongs to God, we must treat referentially and we must treat it with what? With honor. Whether they are material things or they are human beings. Once something is dedicated to God, we must give it that honor and that reference. We must give it that honor and that reference. Our time is fast spent. Let's move to today's teaching. We want to look at David's art towards people. And this is one thing I want us to know. That the state of our heart towards people is a reflection of the state of our heart towards God. I repeat. The state of our heart towards people is a reflection of the state of our heart towards God. You can't love God and hate people. They're not work. You cannot fear God and abuse, assault, 
or destroy people. No. Because you will know that everyone, every human being was created in the image of God. So when you see the way people treat other people, if I, uh, it, was, it was John, the apostle of love, that was saying that in the book of 1 John, 2 John, and he was saying, see, you can't tell us you love God. And you have not shown that love to the man that you can see. So how you relate with the people that you see with other people is a reflection of your heart towards God. He even said, he said, what is true religion? He said, true religion is love your neighbor as yourself. True religion, that's what it is all about. So people cannot get... The, the, the depth of your spirituality is not in the size of your Bible, but in the size of your heart. It's not in the size of your Bible. It's not in the length of your prayers. You can't lock yourself in the room and pray in tongue for 12 hours, but by the time you came out, you fought somebody who took your bucket of water. Or who, who put on your slippers. Or who parked their car where you used to park your own car? And then the whole community is in trouble. No. You can't teach in Sunday school. You can't be a pastor and you teach so much that when you teach people, won't even kiss your mouth. But the words that come out of your mouth, the language you use on people, you tell people they are stupid, they are weak. You, you use all manner of words on people. There is nothing spiritual. And David exemplified this. So when we see that David's heart is inclined towards God, we are going to see it today in his heart towards people. First is his heart towards his boss and his predecessor. Second Samuel chapter 1. We are going to read quite a number of scripture today. It's Bible study. And it's a character study. So it's in several places in the Bible. We are going to read quite a number of them. Second Samuel chapter 1. But let's, let, let's start from 1 Samuel 31, which showed us the death of Saul. Remember the, remember the story of Saul and David. David was anointed king. Saul was the reigning king. God rejected Saul. And there was not this issue between Saul and David. Saul wanted to kill David. Who gave every opportunity to kill David? Now, if somebody is after you to kill you, you now heard that the person had died. What should be the next thing we should hear from you? You should do a testimony. You should come and do testimony. See, some of the testimonies you come and give in church, if David were to be in church, David would, would, would call you zero because there are no testimonies. There are no testimonies. My enemy have died. Wow. The one that even used to excite me the most. Some people say, I, I was traveling in a bus, 18-seater bus. We had an accident. Everybody died. We are thankful that only that you survived. We, we really are grateful to God that you survived. But there is a way you should present that testimony that does not make it look like those people who did not survive did not have God. And this is why I used to picture it. Imagine that husband and wife wrote the same exam. Husband and wife. The same exam. Wife pass. Husband fail. Then Sunday you want to give testimony. How will you give the testimony? You will give the testimony with all manner of emotional intelligence. Because you know that the emotions of your husband, somebody you know, even in December, people come and say, I want to thank God, I did not lose anybody in my family. Those who lost, did you consider them in that your testimony? Did you accommodate them in your mind? Because some of people lost people. By the time you are giving that testimony that you passed the exam, I want to thank God for the exam we wrote, we thank God how we went, we give out all the good, you go and sit down. You know, say, hmm, 
that exam. Out of all of us that wrote the exam, and your husband is sitting in church, <laughs> you know that day that you have misyan. That your testimony will put you through a lot of tests that day. So let's start. Let's let's stress with the story. First Amendment thirty one. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from the from the Philistine and fell down slain in Mount Gil- Gilboa. And the Philistine followed Ad upon Saul and upon his son, and the Philistines slew Jonathan. Jonathan is who? Saul's son. Who is David's friend? So he died first. That was a message for another day. Jonathan shouldn't have died. But it's not today's message. The reason why Jonathan died is because Jonathan chose to follow what used to be rather than follow where God is now. Because God said, I have rejected Saul. And somewhere in his mind, he knew it. And he was, he was not David that formed alliance with Jonathan. It was Jonathan that formed alliance. So somewhere in the heart of Jonathan, Jonathan knew this is the way to go. But on that faithful day, he had to choose between either following David or following Saul to battle. That's how it is for many of us. After we have turned to God, then there is a decision that you have to make. Whether you should follow God on that journey or you should go back to how you used to do things. There used to be a young lady that got born again. And she was this Ron's girl and I told her when she got born again. Young lady, now that you are born again, you will not be able to make money how you used to make money before. What finally took her back was that she needed money and she couldn't go the way of God to get the money. She still went the way she used to know. And that was the end of it. So that was what killed Jonathan. Jonathan Jonathan would have been with David. Jonathan should not have died. But it was even the first name they mentioned that died. That was why when T.D.J. preached the message. He called it Jonathan's judgment. And called it Saul's suicide. We're going to see it here. And Abinadab and Malachi Shua, Saul's son, three sons. And the battle went Saul against Saul. And the archers, they eat him, those who throw bows and arrow. They eat him, and he was so wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto the armor bearer, Draw thy sword and trust me, because they had, already, they had already pierced him. So he was bleeding. So he told the man, Please. Draw your sword and trust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and trust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, because I would also fear the Lord, for he was so afraid. Therefore, Saul took a sword and fell on it. What do you call that? Suicide. He fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died, and his three, his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men, that same day together. And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley, and they that were on the other side of Jordan, saw that the men of Israel fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And it came to pass on the following day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul... And I want you to follow the story very well because somebody reported it wrongly. So follow what happened. So the, the, that means his body was left there, isn't it so? Until the following day, then the Philistine came there, they stripped the slain, and they found Saul and his three sons falling in Mount Gibwa, and they cut off his head. Because cutting off the head is a sign of victory. That was why even after David conquered Goliath, he did what? He cut off his head and took it to the city. Is a sign of conquest. And stripped off his armor. David also removed the armor of Goliath. Remember that story? All right, because when you, when you now remove the armor of, the, of, the, of your enemy, it now becomes part of your armor. So you are, you are growing in your military artillery. And sent into the land of the Philistine and about to publish it in the house of their idols among the people. It was a shameful death. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth is a god. And they fastened his body to the wall of Bashan. 
It's a disgraceful death. And when the inhabitants of Jabez Gilead out of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his son from the wall of Bashan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and, fast, and fasted how many days? Seven days. That's the story. Yo. Now see what happened. Second Samuel 1. Excuse me. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites and David had abode two days in Ziglag. It came even to pass on the third day that behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and sand upon his head. And so it was, when he came to David, that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said to him, From where do you come from? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered that the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people are also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed Ad after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me. Because my life is yet old in me. So I stood upon him and slew him. Because I was sure that he could not live after that he was falling. And I took the crown that was upon his head. And the bread that was upon his arm. And I brought them either unto my Lord. Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them. And likewise all the men that were with him. Was that supposed to be the response of David? He should have been happy. But he tore his clothes because God's anointed had died a shameful death. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am of, the son of a stranger and a Malachite. And David said unto him, How were you not afraid? To stretch forth thy hands to destroy the lost anointed. He thought he had done well. He has helped to kill the enemy of David. And David called one of his young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him and he died. He did not even kill the solo. He just fabricated his story. Because we have read how Saul died. He fabricated the story so that it would look like, because he thought it was going to sound well in the ears of who? Of David. They killed him. Oh, they finished him there. And David said to him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth are testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. And David lamented, with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan and his son. And he also bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Joshua. The beauty of, look, look at the poem he wrote. The beauty of Israel is slain upon high place, the high places. How are the mighty falling? Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the street of Ashkelon. He's saying that this is what has happened. You should not even be talking about it. Let's make it secret. Let's not people not hear how, how he died. If it's you. <laughs> so he died. I want to thank God that the, it's not just that he died. 
He died a shameful death. Is God not good? So before Jesus gave the new commandment, where he says, love your enemies. Pray for them that despitefully use you. David was already operating by that principle. That was why people believed that David operated in the New Testament, even though he was in the Old Testament. He was a man of the New Testament. He was a man that understood really what the mind of God was. Because while David was doing this, the book of the law that they were operating with says an eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. That is the constitution that they were operating with. But because his heart is inclined towards God, he really knew what the mind of God is. That the mind of God is for nobody to perish. Tell it not in God, publish it not in the street of Ascalon. Let the daughters of the Philistine rejoice. Let the daughters of the circumstance triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew. Let not let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offering. For there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast, is vilely cast away, the shield of Saul, as though he had not been anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan, Turn not back, and the sword of Saul return not empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives. Imagine. Oh. He didn't even say evil of the man after his death. Upon all the bad things that the man did to him. Look at what he said. <laughs> Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their life. Do you know? That even though Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus, made Jesus to be crucified and all the rest of that, there is no place in the Bible that neither Jesus nor the other apostle spoke, spoke of it. See what that man did? Nobody. Or just quiet. Nobody cast aspersions on him. Nobody, nobody judged him. Everybody just kept quiet. If when they were going to talk about it, they would just say, our other guy, who this, this, and this, well, let's now vote another person to replace him. That was it. See, when you are excited, when something evil happens to somebody you don't like, let me put it another way. When you are excited, when something evil happens to somebody that does not like you, you don't have the fear of God. What did I say? You don't have the fear. Your heart towards God is not right. Because if your heart towards God is right, you, you will never rejoice at the downfall of anybody, even if that person is your enemy. You will never, you will never. Do you know why? When you rejoice over the downfall of your enemy, people that don't like you, which means you will not be excited about their lifting. Let me tell you, there are some people now that if you hear that they have made it in life, you will be sad. Do you know that? Now, if you are just passing by and they say, ah, see that young boy at the age of 19, he has built three duplexes in Lagos, he, had, uh, he has an estate in Abuja, it does not do you anything. You don't care. But let it be somebody that you know that maybe the man that failed you a course in your year two, that made you have extra year, you now hear that he has made it in life. How do how? Like that guy said, how? How did he make it? You know why he made it? Because you are not God. That's why he made it. Because you don't know what has now transpired between him and God the last time you left him? And the reason why you are like that is because you do not even know God and know that God is loving and merciful. And like I used to say, when you are the one that needs mercy, 
you call on God to be merciful. But you don't feel some other person deserves that mercy because it is who they offended. But when you are the one caught in trouble, you ask for mercy, Lord, please, please have mercy. Even when you know that you did what was wrong and judgment is coming. But when some other person offends you and did what was wrong, you don't think, and God is not you. Somebody say, God is not me. Thank God, though. If people were to be God, <laughs> people, they'll be measuring oxygen for you, teaspoon, teaspoon, every day. Just today, you have just this teaspoon of oxygen. That's it. Even the thing that you, you have thought in your mind against somebody, person that stole your phone, what you have imagined in your heart against the person, if it happens, if that thing has come to pass, it's not just that David did not imagine evil against Saul in his heart. David does not even want anything evil to happen to the man. Because David still believes somewhere in his mind that Saul does not have to die for me to be enthroned. Somebody does not have to die for me to prosper. No. And like I used to say, since the day people have been praying and killing witches, they have not, nothing has changed in their life. Three witches have died now. No, no breakthrough yet. So don't you change the prayer? Say, ah, ha, ah, they should just remove that man from that department. There's something should just happen to him. Finally, the man have died. Nothing has changed. <laughs> Because see, evil is on the earth. So if a custodian of evil dies, another person takes it over. Evil must remain. Evil must remain. Have you know even in schools? Yeah, there is one cause. There is one cause. Ah, hey God! By the time it got to your turn, somehow God answered the prayer. Another lecturer is now taking that course. You now have a problem in another course. Because evil have changed and. <laughs> so one of the prayers that David used to pray is that God should deliver him from the hand of his enemy. God should deliver him. It's not God should Bond them. God should do what? God should deliver him from the hand of his enemy. Let's look at David's uh, that is forgiveness in the heart of David. I'm going to show you quite a number of that. We just saw it there and we're going to see more about that. Second Samuel chapter 13. Second Samuel chapter 13. Verse 38 to 39. The heart of God is the heart of forgiveness. So when God said David is a man after God's heart, David is very forgiving. Second Samuel 13, 38. Hmm. Now, let me tell you, the, I don't want us to read all the story. The background of the story was the fact that Ammon, Abi Amnon, one of David's son raped Tamar, David's daughter. Now, because David has quite a number of wives, so Ammon's mother was different from Tamar's mother. So Ammon is like half brother to Tamar. However, Tamar is the direct blood sister of Absalom. So after the rape incident happened and everybody talked about it, David was not happy with it. 
and he went that way. He did not leave Absalom. Absalom still knows it in his mind that one day he's going to get back at uh, Amnon for raping his uh, sister. So they organized a party. When they got to the party, Absalom ordered that Amnon be killed. So they killed Amnon and David became very sorrowful, very sad. Not just sorrowful and sad. He became very angry with Absalom. That Absalom had to run away from town. Because David does, just, David does not like vengeance. They have raped your sister. Okay, forgive and forget. You now waited for two years. Two years. You know it in your mind. And in their mind, they were going for a party. They even told their father, we are going for a party in our brother's house. So let everybody, uh, everybody go now. In the midst of the wedding and dining, they killed the guy. David added that he was mad. Let's start from verse 36. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of speaking, that behold, the king's son came. And lifted up their voice and wept. And the king also and his servant wept sore. Verse 37. But Absalom did what? Fled. And went to Talmai, the son of Amiud, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. He was mourning for Amnon. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur. And was there how many years? Three years. David was displeased with him. But David's heart is a very soft heart. Verse 39. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom. For he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. There are some people you have vowed not to see in your life. You don't want to even see them again in your life. <laughs> David was angry. He was displeased. But before you know it, his heart was longing for his son. Let's go to chapter, chapter 14 from verse 1. This is a long read, but follow me. We are looking at the heart of David. Now, Joab, the son of Zeruiah, perceived that the king's heart was towards Absalom. And Joab, because Joab is like David's right hand man. Joab said, hey, he's like, the king's heart is now soft. Let's do something. And Joab sent to Tekoa and fetched thence a wise woman and said unto her, I pray thee. Let's see it in NLT so that it be clear. Give it to us in NLT. He sent for a woman from Tekoa who had a reputation for great wisdom. He said to her, Pretend you are in mourning. Wear mourning clothes and don't put on lotions. Act like a woman who has been mourning for the dead of a long t- for a long time. Then go to the king and tell him the story I am about to tell you. Then Joab told her what to say. When the woman from Tekoa approached the king, she bowed with her face to the ground in deep respect and cried out, Oh king, help me. What's the trouble, the king asked. At last, I am a widow, she replied. My husband is dead. My two sons had a fight out in the field. And since no one was there to stop it, one of them was killed. Now the rest of the family is demanding. Let us have your son. We will execute him for murdering his brother. He doesn't deserve to inherit the family's property. They want to extinguish the only coal I have left. And my husband's name and family will disappear from the face of the earth. Leave it to me, the king told her. Go home. You know David now. I will see to it that no one touches him. Oh, thank you, my lord, the king, the woman from Tekoa replied. If you are criticized for helping me, let the blame fall on me and on my father's house. And let the king and his throne be what? Be innocent. If anyone objects, 
the king said, bring him to me. I can assure you he will never complain again. Then she said, please swear to me by the Lord your God that you won't let anyone take vengeance against my son. I want no more bloodshed. As surely as the Lord lives, he replies, not a hair on your son's head will be disturbed. (laughs) Please allow me to ask one more thing of my Lord the king. She said, go ahead and speak, he responded. She replied, why don't you do as much for the people of God as you have promised to do for me? You have convicted yourself in making this decision because you have refused to bring home your own banished son. See, when it is somebody else's matter, we are good at giving advice. The relationship you are now, if it is somebody that comes to seek counsel from you concerning that relationship, you will know what to say. But now it's your own. It looks as if you don't have sense again. <laughs> it looks as if wisdom disappeared. When they are even telling you, that can't you see? You can't see. You. <laughs> That's all. That is why it is good for us to expose ourselves always to the word of God. Because the word of God is like what? A mirror. As you are reading it, you will see yourself as, ah, you know, it's very easy for us to read the story of, uh, of Judas. He betrayed Jesus for money. Oh, should we be asking ourselves how many times we have betrayed God because of money? It is very, very easy for us to say, oh, um, Esau, Esau sold his birthright for a plate of muscle. Well, it was porridge that was available then. Now it's our man pizza that is available. You know the things you have sold for G Wagon and Co. iPhone. That's what it, in our own days now is now iPhone, she. So it is very easy for us to judge the matter when we are not the, 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 the one involved. But one thing I like about David, anytime they give it back to him like that, he does not say no. That principle applies to only you. It does not apply to He does not change his mouth. That's why they said he's a man of integrity. All of us must die eventually. Our lives are like water spilled out on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God does not just sweep life away. Instead, he devises way to bring us back when we have been separated from him. Wow. That's the New Testament. That no matter how, God is always looking for a way to do what? To bring us back to himself. I have come to plead with my Lord the King because people have threatened me. I said to myself, perhaps the King will listen to me and rescue us from those who would cut us off from the inheritance God has given to us. Let me tell you this. I was sharing with some people on, Thursday, on, on Monday. This is what the devil does. One major thing, the Bible says that the devil is is called the accuser of the brethren. And he does it consistently. The Bible says he accuses them before the Lord day and night. What is an accusation? Who can tell me? What is an accusation? You can Google it. It's an English word. I want you to understand the tactics of the devil. Because, see, even though we are reading the story of David, there is a lot about it. Because he's showing us the heart of the father. He's showing us the heart of the father. So who can tell me? Have you Googled, Googled it? What, what, what's, what's the meaning of... Uh, what did I call it now? Accusation. What is an Accusation. Because that's what the devil does. You say what? A charge of wrongdoing. Another one. 
Give it to us very well. I'm hearing you. Someone has done something wrong or illegal. Now, from that word, done, it means accusation is using the past against you. It is about what you have done. So, there's an example I like using. You guys should have known that example by now. The devil will tell you. I don't know whether he told you, but he told me. Then, to go take meat from my mommy's pot. I know you are holy. From your mother's womb, you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You never did such things. Leave us alone. God finally saved us. So those days, the devil will tell me to go take meat from my mommy's pot. I'm, I'm a smart and intelligent boy. And I know that my mom is also smart and intelligent. Somehow I know she counted the meat. Even though she may not count it. But something in me tells me he counted it. I will now ask the devil. That now that mommy counted this meat. If I remove one, she will know. She will flog me. The devil will say, I'll leave that in. Remove one. Eat that one. Then cut one into two. So the number will still be the same. Then as you are approaching the pot, the devil will tell you, look at the arrangement of the pot very well. Look at where they put the spoon. Look at where they put the cover. So that when you remove the one you want to remove, you can arrange it back properly. Are we in the same WhatsApp group? Good. Then you will pick the meat and eat the meat. And I hope you know, Stolen water is sweeter. That's why premarital sex is sweeter. That's why fornication is sweeter. Yeah, very sweet. It's sweeter. Stolen waters. If you steal rice from the same pot, it tastes different from when they now serve you your own. It's just different. The devil garnishes his gifts. It makes it taste great. Now, this is where I'm going. After you had eaten that meat, maybe the next moment, you want to pray. <laughs> As you kneel down to pray, the same devil, <laughs> you now want to pray. Did you not hear that God does not hear the voice of sinners? That the voice of sinners is like a barking of dog in the ears of God. You have knelt down to pray. What will you do immediately? You will stand up. Because the devil's intention always is to separate you from God. So what does he do? He puts sin on you. So when he puts sin on you, he tells you with this sin. He will even quote the Bible to you and say, God does not contain iniquity. The hands of the Lord is clean. Who will come to this holy ill? Except the one that has a pure heart and a clean heart. He will quote that scripture to you. To tell you that because you are stained with sin, you can come to the Father. And you know what? You just did it once. Because you did it once and you do not go back to the Father, you already feel dirty. You know that once you are dirty, it is easier to get dirtier. Once you are already dirty, like I told them on Monday, every rag that is in your house today, using to clean the floor, started where? It's on, as a Sunday clothes. Birthday clothes, Christmas clothes, that's how it started. But one stain that didn't remove, another stain that didn't remove, it left your Sunday to midweek. Another stain that didn't remove, it left your midweek to house clothes. Another stain that didn't remove, it left house clothes to cleaning dining table. See how it is moving gradually away from purpose. See how one stain 
after the other. See how he's moving gradually away from what? Away from purpose. Before you know it, he leaves the dining table to be cleaning sitting room floor. Before you know, he needs to clean that, not even the inside the house kitchen. You know that kitchen that used to be behind the house with black pots, coal, charcoal, and firewood? It will not be there. Very soon, you need to bring that pot from the fire. Christmas clue. Just go and look at all the rag in your house and check their history. <laughs> Some people have become those rags today. They were once righteous. They were once holy. But they fell into a sin and the devil told them, see how stained you are. Now, this is not the question. When you get dirty, where should you go? Mm, in real life. Into the bathroom. But you know what the devil tells you? The devil tells you you are too dirty for the bathroom. Because the presence of God is the place of cleansing. He washes us by the water of his word. In his presence. But the devil keeps you. It is in that presence you will receive forgiveness. It is in that presence you will receive mercy. He said, come boldly to the throne of grace. That you may obtain grace and find mercy and grace to help in time of need. The devil wants to separate you from God. That's why the devil couldn't get David. Because David was quick at repentance. You must be quick at what? Repentance. As soon as you fall or the devil puts a sin on you, right there and there, say, Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me. No, I shouldn't have done it. Watch me with your precious blood. Lord, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said what you said. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Sin shouldn't have dominion over me. I shouldn't use my mouth to speak guile. I shouldn't, the word that will come out of my mouth is supposed to communicate grace. Immediately, you repent. What is happening? You are being washed. Then you can continue in the presence of God. But you know, as I knelt down to pray that day, and the devil reminds me, you, 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 you that stole meat, you want to pray. I didn't pray again that day. I didn't pray again the second day. I didn't pray again the third day. What is happening to me? I'm moving farther away. And the more I'm moving farther away from God, the more I'm getting deeper into sin. That is why you will see certain believers, you will doubt that they are born again. Not that they fall into fornication. is now their primary assignment. Not that they told a lie by mistake. They are now liars by excellence. Why? Because one lie that they told, they didn't repent. That one lie they told, shift them from God's presence. The devil accused them. It's called what? The accuser of brethren. What is his purpose? To keep you separated from God. If there is any lesson we learn from David, is to always fall back into God's presence. Let God beat me. It's okay. Let God beat me. See, I know some parents, they are very principled. They are very strict. But they did not balance it with love. So, and that is the picture of God many of us have. I'm going to preach a message probably in, in the month of March. Call on me God. Because the picture of God many of us have in our head is not God. It's the picture of your father at home that you extrapolated that this is how God too should be. Because let me tell you how God is. God is so strict and principled, like many parents are so strict and principled, ensuring that their children does not miss the mark. But this is where the, this is where the problem is. If per adventure they now miss the mark, can they come back home? Some children, some daughters, if they mistakenly get pregnant in school, they would rather, they would rather die than go home. Billy Graham, the world's greatest evangelist, world greatest evangelist, his daughter got married and got divorced. And he welcomed her home. He didn't judge her. In fact, 
That is what made the daughter really believe God. He said, I experienced the love of God from my father. I experienced what? The love of God from my father. I used to tell people around me those days, ah, but don't do, don't do, don't do this, or don't go and go to a boy's house. Don't. But once it happens, come back. <laughs> I did here for you. And they used to come back. Ah, Pastor, if you are pregnant, come. How much is hospital? Take. Go and register. We'll buy you baby things. I will name the baby. I will pray for the baby. I will take care of you. We said, let's not open, let's not open. Now that it has happened, come back home. Do what? Come back home. We can't be so strict and so principled that when our children fall down, they can't come back home. That's not God the Father. That's why David can say, let me fall into his hand. You know how his hand is. He, 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 he can tap me small, tap me small, but I know he loves me. And rescue us from those who would cut us off from the inheritance God has given us, verse 17. Yes, my Lord, the king will give us peace of mind again. I know that you are like an angel of God in discerning good from evil. May the Lord your God be with you. I must know one thing, the king replied, and tell me the truth. Yes, my Lord, the king, she responded. Did Joab put you up to this? Have a brand. What did I say? Have a brand. That when your younger sister does something, your, your father should have Senior was involved in this thing. We say, yes, yes. Be known for something. Be unique. Stand out. Is Joab involved in this, your plan? Because this wisdom that I'm seeing now, I've passed you. <laughs> My Lord the King, how can I deny it? Nobody can hide anything from you. Yes, Joab sent me and told me what to say. So this is what I said now. It's not my own. He did it to place the matter before you in a different light. Let me say this here. It's not part of the message, but see. Some of us, we need to learn this wisdom. In dealing with people in authority. Starting from your parents. There are many things you want to do that if you go and tell your father by yourself, you know, agree. You know, agree. Your father says you should study medicine. You say you want to do tech. You now have your two chests to go and tell your father by yourself. And I say, my father, my father, we know, you are now quarreling. The more you quarrel, you withdraw your pocket money. <laughs> you quarrel again, he said, come back home now. Tomorrow I'm going to see my house 24 hours. They lock you in. Maybe it's because you, are a you want to do tech. Come and sit down in this house. He sits you down in the house. But there is a wisdom. There is what? A wisdom. There is somebody that the man listens to. There is somebody that the man respects. Say, sir. I don't know whether you can help me talk to my daddy. Two things the man will do to you. The man will either go and speak on your behalf or tell you how to speak. The man may not even speak directly. The man may just sit down with your father and say, "Ah, my son is not into techo. In fact, he made his first million. Because what your father is after is not the medicine, but that you should make it in life. Your father does not like syringe like that. It's not as if he like. <laughs> your father, is, what your father is all about is that you, but your father cannot see how you will make the kind of money he's thinking in his mind through the tech you say you want to do. And this is you there. You don't even have communication skills to present it. Well, daddy, oh. Daddy, oh. Please, please. This is I see. Me, me, I want to meet. Da, daddy, oh. Da. That's my father doesn't want you to listen to me. My father doesn't want you to listen to me. Because your father sees you as a child. 
as I am like this, this is him as a child. I went to see my grandmother. She's still advising me. Remember the son of who you are? Me like this. <laughs> she still told me. She said, as you are going in that place you are, remember the son of who you are. I should remember the father of who I am. <laughs> but you are wise as an angel of God and you understand everything that happens among us. Let's move on. We'll close now. So the king sent for Joab and told him, All right, go and bring back the young man, Absalom. Move on. Joab bowed with his face to the ground in deep respect and said, At last, I know that I have gained your approval. My lord the king, for you have granted this request. Then Joab went to Gesho and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. That is Second Samuel Chapter 14. I'm coming. All right, let's, let's stop there for tonight. I would have loved us to read when Absalom died and all the rest of it, but we're going to continue next week. This, for the next three weeks, we're going to look at, or two weeks thereabouts, we're going to look at David's art towards people. This message is brought to you from Victory Chapel Church and Campus.